Welcome to Clare College. Our Digital Gala Week is now on its third day and we'd be delighted to welcome so many of our alumni and friends to join us, especially during this time where it's so difficult to travel to Cambridge and to attend events in person. And that's particularly the case tonight uh, as we have a, an international speaker with us. Before I introduce him, I just wanted to run through a couple of items of housekeeping. The first is to let you know that the, this uh, session is being recorded this evening and the link to the talk will be available on the college website from tomorrow morning. So please do feel free to access it and of course to share it with anybody else that you think might be interested in Damien's talk. We'll be allowing plenty of time at the end of the session for questions. Um, I ask that you submit questions as we go using the chat function and I will, I will review those and I'm happy to feed those to Damien at the end of his talk. Um, so there'll be plenty of time to uh, pose, pose your questions to him. Just remains for me to introduce Damien. Damien, would you like to switch your camera on now? There we are, <laughs> the man okay. himself, hello. <laughs> so Damien, Damien came to Claire as a postgraduate student uh, 10 years ago in 2011 where he achieved a Master of Studies in International Relations. This was the very same year that he was also awarded an MBE for services to community development and human rights for his work in Rio de Janeiro. Damien lived and worked in Rio between 2005 and 2019, and he speaks to us from Rio tonight, although he is based permanently in Nairobi, in Kenya. So this is indeed one of the marvels of our online technology is that we're able to, to welcome him um, all the way from Rio and of course our guests from wherever you may be around the world. In tonight's talk, Nothing by Accident, Damien will discuss the impact of organised crime on politics, the rule of law and democracy in Brazil. He will challenge the stereotypes we might have about gangs from poor communities and he will offer a new narrative to explain the chronic violence and corruption in the country. So over to you, Damien. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Um, thanks, uh, first of all, to Claire for ha having invited me to speak today. Um, it's a privilege, as it was a privilege to attend the university as well. Um, and I will explain today how um, my studies at Cambridge helped me um, to much better understand the city I was living and working at the time, where, as Katie said, where I lived for nearly 14 years and where I'm speaking from today. Um, so I can give a presentation. I will we'll, uh, share my screen with you. You just bear with me for a second. So um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a cloudy day in Rio today, so it doesn't look quite like this. But this is um, uh, a very arresting image of the city. It's a very um, spectacular city. Um, it's got a bit of everything, sea, mountains, coast, um, a tropical rainforest. And um, it's a city that most people know, have a basic idea about. Most people know what Rio looks like. They know it's quite spectacular. And they might also know about the city's very uh, famous carnival, which is its sort of trademark over the world. Um, this is an image of the famous carnival parade that um, didn't take place this, this year, but it's due to take place next year. And um, it's viewed by millions in Brazil and, and the world over. And then here is another iconic image of the city, uh, which is a rather um, more sad and less joyful image. And in fact, it's a still from the famous City of God film. And in fact, um, just before uh, we started, I was talking to Katie and she said that basically City of God is her, uh, her reference point for Rio. And in fact, 
as it was a film that lots of people saw 20 years ago, and that's why I included it, um, because City of God um, is a very good film. It's based on a true story, but it also limits uh, the narrative and, and understandings about Rio to one particular aspect of the city's problems. Um, and it makes that seem as if that is the only problem in the city, which is the problem of gang gangs and gun and drug violence in the city's poor communities. So what I'm going to do today is to um, present an alternative narrative that I think helps us to understand um, the city better and to also understand why certain problems persist, persist because it's not to deny there is a serious problem with drug and gang violence, but it's only part of the city's um, predicament. And that also it's been uh, an issue that has gone on for many, many years. So it's a status quo. And if you want to understand why something continues, you need to look at the wider structures that sustain it. And that's what I'll be doing today. So I'm going to be offering, offering an alternative narrative that doesn't talk about favelas and drugs and gangs and which in fact identifies some of the hidden structures in the city that sustain um, disorder and criminality. And I think although I'm talking about Rio, I think this could be applied to any long running conflict in the world, especially in a country, for example, like Colombia or perhaps Congo, where you have long running conflicts that constantly mutate, but fundamentally um, the violence continues unabated. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the structures that sustain the situation in Rio. Um, just to tell you a bit about my history, I've worked um, with human rights issues in Rio and trying to um, work on behalf of the communities that are worst affected by violence in the city for 20 years. This photo is of um, an Amnesty International mission, which I was part of, which included the Secretary General of Amnesty International at the time, Irene Khan, and this was in 2003, and we were part of a delegation visiting a favela where four men had been executed by police, and it was in what Amnesty calls an emblematic case, where you work on a case to um, illustrate a wider problem. After um, eight years at Amnesty International, I moved to Rio and worked in the city, and I worked within some of the communities that are very affected by violence and the idea of working within these communities was to um, be present with the people who are suffering from the problem to learn more about it from their point of view and also to open up uh, spaces for um, dialogue spaces where you could represent those communities in a different way and in this case this was in the first place to be called a favela in Brazil, which is called Providencia in central Rio. And I worked with a prize winning artist called JR, who did an enormous photo installation using women's photos, which was um, part of a way in to telling the story of the women in that community. Also, more recently, I've um, worked on other projects with young people. Um, this is a project that I organized to build a skate park in another favela in Rio, which is a favela afflicted by um, violence between the police and gangs and between rival gangs. So we built a skate park as a way of um, providing a leisure space and um, a space for young people to meet peacefully in that community. So as I was saying earlier, um, part of the problem about trying to understand the systematic violence in Rio is that um, there's this narrative of a drug war that stretches from City of God um, until today. And I would stress that City of God is a film that's set in the 1970s and 1980s. This photograph um, was taken in 2011 and it shows part of a process called pacification, which was when um, Brazil was preparing and Rio was preparing to host both the 2014 World Cup and the 2016 Olympics. And in order to show the world um, that it was going to overcome its reputation for violence, the authorities um, carried out occupations of favelas. And in this case, um, the army was sent in and then police would occupy the favela afterwards. 
And this um, was the story that the Brazilian authorities and the city authorities sold to the world that um, we're going to make the city safe because we are now going to um, militarily occupy all of the favelas in the city. And um, the problem with this narrative is it makes it seem like it's a very binary cops against robbers situation. And that um, once you put the police into a place like that, that every, all the city's problems are going to be solved, but it's not, it's much more complicated. And um, I was living and working in Rio at the time and I was quite excited that this was an opportunity to help um, reduce violence in the city and to help the world outside understand a bit better what was going on. But unfortunately, this didn't work um, because the world's media bought into this narrative. Uh, journalists were accompanied to join in the military invasions when they went into a favela and um, they reported back to the world on this story. Fundamentally, what this whole drug war narrative does is it criminalizes these poor communities. It makes it seem like um, they're the sources of all crime and all of um, Rio's problems with criminality. And as well as this, it provides a smokescreen for serious organized crime and state entrenched organized crime to hide behind. Um, and that's why I think it needs to be challenged. And I began to really think about this seriously and in a much more um, calm environment. So this was in between 2011 and 2013, at the same time the pacification process was taking place. I was very lucky and fortunate to get a place at uh, Cambridge to study international relations and um, was a member of Clare College. So I was very fortunate to be able to do that and to be able to spend some time out of the city and reflect upon this um, complex and very violent situation that I've been working in for the last six years. And um, in the second year of the international relations course, you can study a dissertation. And I, I wanted to write my dissertation about Rio. And because the pacification program was happening at that time, and I was actually working in a social department that was part of it. So we were supposed to go in after the police had gone in and we were supposed to help set up um, state services in those communities. Um, because I was so involved in it, I thought I would write about it. And um, I had a series of meetings with my supervisor and at every meeting um, we sort of got to a point where I felt very frustrated and I realized that I was unhappy about um, studying this process in the way that I thought I was just going to be reproducing this pacification narrative. Even if I was critically studying it, I was once more, I was just going to be contributing to this whole discourse um, that poor people are at the root of the problem. So I, my supervisor was quite canny and she said, listen, I think you need to go and spend some time and um, think about what you want to study and then think hard about if there's anything else you'd like to study. So um, I went off and I put on my thinking cap and I thought about an aspect of life in Rio that I'd really, that really fascinated me and that I didn't know anything about. And it's um, an illegal lottery. And this photograph is showing you uh, 25 animals because the lottery is called the Jogo do Bicho in Portuguese, which means the game of the animal. And it, it's a lottery that was invented to raise funds for Rio's first zoo in um, 1890. So it's about 130 years old and it's been illegal in Rio and in Brazil for about 128 years. And because it quickly became very popular and um, the authorities in the city at the time decided that it was a moral issue and they didn't want the population to be, get involved in gambling. And so they banned it the lottery was made illegal and it went underground um, but it remained immensely popular and um, entrepreneurial uh, people would sell tickets on the side and um, the lottery stayed and grew more and more popular and it's still very popular in the city today so i'm just going to show you on the left that's a ticket i bought about five or six years ago 
and it's a handwritten lottery ticket. There are four draws in the, each day. That one is the breakfast draw. And um, I bought it from a vendor on my street corner. And part of the reason why I wanted to understand this lottery because there was this whole narrative about we're going to bring law and order to Rio. We're going to make the city safe. We're going to send the army into the favelas. And yet this illegal lottery, which I knew was illegal, just carried on. And I would sometimes see police walk past the ticket vendor and I wanted to understand how it worked. So I changed uh, my dissertation subject, started to read about the lottery, to play it, to learn about it. In the middle is a results slip. And um, on the right there, you can see um, a modern ticket, which is in fact an electronic ticket. So it's gone in a few years from being handwritten to being electronic, which tells me that the people who run it are probably earning more money than ever these days. Quite quickly, um, I began to understand that I'd made the right choice in studying this um, practice. When I spoke to a civil policeman, who um, these are the investigative police in Rio, they're quite highly educated. And this was a policeman who was well known for uh, tackling organized crime. I'm just going to read this quote because I think it will help you to understand exactly how um, important this issue and how much it affects Brazilian society. If you go deeply into this, the Jogo do Bicho, at the very minimum, you'll be studying the history of the Republic, or better, the history of Brazilian politics since the proclamation of the Republic. The history of organized crime in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil begins with the Bicheros. The first criminal organization in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil is run by the Bicheros. But there's no organized crime without the state. It penetrates the state. In our case, it confuses itself with the state itself. You get to a point where you don't know what is the state and what is a Bichero. So fundamentally, this uh, policeman was telling me that the, the racket that is the lottery is so strong that it's become completely infused with the state um, apparatus. And he talks about bichero, bichero. The game is called the Jogo do Bicho. The Bicheros um, were the people who run the lottery. And in the 1950s, they began to organize themselves into groups headed by patrons. And this man here is perhaps the most famous lottery patron of all time. He is a man called Castor de Andragi, and um, he ran a big Jogo do Bicho operation in Rio from the 1950s until the late 1990s, so for 40 years. He also was one of the founders of an organizing committee for the lottery, and he also was one of the people who oversaw the fact that they overtook Rio Carnival Parade. So they organized the Rio Carnival. And this is taken um, when it's just been declared that he is the winner of that year's carnival. Um, he is also the person who put um, the lottery organizers in touch with international mafias, including the Sicilian mafia. And that's what I think I would really like people to understand who are listening to this talk is that the Jogo do Bicho, these um, mafias are as powerful in Brazil, in Rio, as the Cosa Nostra is in Sicily, and that they're powerful across Brazil because the, the game is ran, run from Rio and played across the country. Um, and so I would say, if you want to think of it in simple terms, these guys would be uh, the Brazilian Cosa Nostra. And also, they didn't just run this illegal lottery because gambling is illegal in all its forms in Brazil. So they also run casinos, um, bingo, and illegal betting syndicates. And it's quite funny for someone, particularly from Britain, to think about bingo being illegal, but it is um, in Brazil. And just to give you an idea of um, how extensive their power is, this is um, a quote from a mafia, former mafia money launderer who worked in Brazil, 
who was giving evidence before um, an inquiry in Italy in 1999. And he explained that um, the mafia sought the Brazilian Jogo de Bicha organizers and um, with them organized money laundering through the use of electronic gambling machines, which are also illegal in Brazil. And he went on to explain um, in a court that in Rio de Janeiro, there is a cupola called the Rio de Janeiro cupola in the concept of cupola as we understand it, i.e. where there is a boss and sub chiefs by areas. Um, the man who made this statement was shot dead three years after making it in Venezuela. And this uh, photo is also used in a study that I read that was very important to my um, work and my dissertation at Cambridge, which is written by a sociologist from Rio. And um, he identified a practice which he called the sale of political merchandise. And by that he meant the sale of a state service to protect an illegal market. So the illegal sale. And in this case, it's very important to understand this photo of Castor de Andrade because he's celebrating his carnival victory. And the two men behind him are uniformed policemen and they're in fact his bodyguards. Which, so this photo explains very clearly um, the relationship. Castor de Andrade is the boss and the patron and the, the men behind him are uniformed city policemen who are in his pay. So that's organized crime being superior to police. And um, Michel Missy explained this very well in his study. And I think what it helps us to understand is that law and order in Rio mustn't be um, reduced to a simple binary cops against robbers narrative that is much more complicated and in fact, if you want to think about Rio and its problems, it's much better to think of cops and robbers. So the police working with um, organized crime for money. And that is a much better um, summary of the situation in the city than um, one that reduces it to favelas and gangs and a drugs war narrative, which is essentially a war on the poor. This is just as a small interlude, I think it's important to remember that um, my study, my dissertation was not just about, I wasn't sitting in a library reading books. I was living in Rio. I was learning as much as I could about the city. And so I also took part in the carnival parade. So the parade is run between different samba schools, which are like teams, and they can have um, up to three or 4,000 people who take part in the parade. Um, they're immensely popular in the city and um, each year they choose a different theme. So in the, the year I took part, the theme was communication and I was in fact dressed as a cockerel and um, I took part in the parade for a very big samba school called Beja Flor, which means hummingbird and it's like the Manchester United of Brazil's samba schools. It's one of the most popular ones across the country. Um, and also it's quite funny when I look at this picture because I remember sending it to my family who were quite worried about what I was getting up to in Rio. And um, I had to explain that in fact, I wasn't just uh, wandering around in fancy dress and drinking beer. I was in fact doing research. On a more serious note, I think um, an important part of my talk today and um, something that I'd really like to get across is that um, these racketeers and these mafias, they have political connections and um, they don't like democracy and they don't like the rule of law because they don't want their businesses to be affected. They don't want their business practices to be interfered with. Um, and for this reason, they, can, they have um, a dislike for democracy and people who defend the rule of law and defend um, human rights will be their enemies. So this woman is, she was a city councillor, an elected politician. Um, her name is Marielle Franco, and she was shot in March, 2018, shot and killed um, along with her driver as she was returning from a meeting. And um, 
She was also someone I knew well, and I'd, worked, I'd known her for 12 years. I knew her long before she was elected to the city council. She was someone who worked with human grassroots, human rights protection, like I did. And um, her death had an impact on me. It was um, very upsetting for lots of people. And it also became, um, it had enormous repercussions, both in Rio, in Brazil, and then around the world. Um, because her story is a compelling story. She's a young black woman from a favela um, who was challenging um, power structures in Brazil. And um, she looked like she was at the beginning of a very bright career. And um, she was assassinated in a very cowardly and a very meticulously planned attack. Um, and as I'm going to explain in a minute, it was really only um, because of the international uproar and the intense media scrutiny that we got. We began, began to understand who might be behind the killing. And um, it also explained very much the power structures in place linked to the lottery mafias um, who want organized crime to maintain control in the city. And um, this came about particularly um, after a few months of investigation that re the Rio police force, the homicide department, um, produced a quite a plausible story. It produced a man that they said had ordered the killing and a former policeman who said um, who they alleged had carried it out. And um, it seemed like almost a, a case closed. And until um, it fell apart, really, when public prosecutors visited um, the military policeman accused of carrying out the murder. And um, he made this statement when he basically identified um, a group of killers operating in Rio who operate with the protection of um, police. And the reason that the police protect them is because they receive money from the gambling mafias to do so. So I'm just going to read this quote as well because I think it's important to understand. What I have to say, nobody would like to hear. There is a battalion of murderers acting for money in Rio today. Most of them coming from contravention, which is the Jogo do Bicho. The homicide police and the head of the civil police know who they are, but they receive money from crooks not to touch or direct the investigations, thus creating a network of protection so that the contravention kills whoever it wants. Tell us, in recent years, which case of a murder has been the tar target of an investigation into a contraventor, another way of saying bichero. And what um, this statement led to the collapse of uh, what they call in Portuguese a farsa, which was the, the story invented to frame certain people in order to protect the actual killers and the, the the eventual people who must have ordered the killing. Um, and it led to a whole new investigation by the public prosecutor's office, which led to the identification of um, several men. And two of them are in a photo here. Um, they're both former military policemen. The one on the right was retired from the military police. Here's the man accused of firing the gun that killed Marielli. And the man on the left had been expelled a few years before. And um, he was the most expensive assassin in Rio. And he was also a former policeman. And um, both of them worked as gunmen for the Jogo do Bicho, for the gambling mafias. Um, and as the statement I just read out said, they, they were protected because high ranking police received money not to investigate their activities. The man on the left, who's called Captain Adriano, um, was killed last year in a police operation. He went on the run and um, was killed in an alleged shootout. But the circumstances su suggest he was probably killed to keep him quiet. The man on the right is um, currently in prison. And um, when they arrested him, they conducted a number of raids. And in a house belonging to a friend of his, they found 115 unassembled uh, machine guns, um, which was the biggest individual seizure 
of weapons in Rio de Janeiro, which also showed that as well as being a probable assassin, he was also um, one of the city's biggest arms dealers. As if that wasn't enough, um, the man on the left was also someone who had been very close, a close associate of the Bolsonaro family, that is the president of Brazil's family, since um, the early 2000s. And I'm just going to read the quote below, which is by Senator Flavio Bolsonaro, who is Jair Bolsonaro's eldest <clears throat> son. He said, I met Adriano in the Bopi, which is the commando police. And Adriano was one, he was a famous sharpshooter. He gave me shooting lessons. I met him through Queiroz, who was another person very close to Jair Bolsonaro, who served with him in the battalion. I don't know which one, said Flavio. I've always been a parliamentarian who liked to praise the policemen who went into combat from day to day in the street for the most risky work. So what this shows us is that um, you have um, police acting as killers within the police structure who are linked not only to mafias, but who are also um, linked to a political clan, in the ca this case, the Bolsonaro clan, who it would appear acted as political patrons um, for these, this type of man. Um, and the, the justification they would have given is that um, they knew him when he was a working policeman and they didn't know about his illegal activities. But in fact, it later transpired that um, Flavio Bolsonaro gave Captain Adriano's, um, he employed his wife and his mother as um, employees when he was working in the Rio State Congress. And um, another unfortunate coincidence, or maybe it's not a coincidence, um, links the man on the right to the Bolsonaro family. He actually lived in the same housing estate um, a, a gated community where the president lived. The president has claimed he, he didn't know who he was. Um, so there is uh, my book, which tells uh, this story in some detail. You can get it, you can find it on Blackwell's or if you use um, another internet trading company, which I won't name, you can also find it there. But if you want to support independent booksellers, you can get it from Blackwells in the UK. Um, I was going to show you a picture of the electronic lottery ticket, which I've lost, but um, I just wanted to explain that the last time I played the lottery was last week. And if you look here on this slide, the ticket is fully electronically printed. And um, when I asked the vendor, because I was used to handwritten tickets, and I asked the vendor, I said, oh, this is interesting. It's changed. It's electronic. He said, oh, I don't really know. You know, I've just started doing this. And I said, oh, um, I've, you know, I'm interested in the Jogu du Bishu. And just, just as a point of interest, like I won't tell anyone, but do you know which of the big Bicheros, which banking family uh, run the lottery in our part of Rio where we live? And he said to me, I don't know, and I don't want to know, um, which is very telling in that even the man who's selling the tickets um, doesn't know who he's working for. And it shows the law of silence and a sort of mafia style omerta, which surrounds this activity, even, suppose, even though it's something very um, much part of Rio's life and um, it's an accepted cultural practice in the city that it is still something that um, is protected by a law of silence. And so just to go back to what I said at the beginning, you know, there's this narrative about city of God and guns and um, gangs, which is the narrative that is sold both locally and um, reproduced internationally. Um, and I believe that this narrative is in fact a smokescreen that helps hide um, serious organized crime, the involvement of politicians in organized crime. And I would say to anyone studying these sorts of issues or who wants to understand a situation that has been going on a long time, it's very important to think about what people aren't discussing 
and to avoid the noise because this narrative works because there's so much noise about it. It's very media friendly um, and it enables something like what appears a simple lottery to pass unnoticed. And um, I think that's what universities are for, um, what studying is for, is to be able to take a bit of time to think about things in more detail and to try and understand them better. And um, it's an issue that I will carry on raising that I've written my book about because I believe that this city deserves a better chance of being peaceful. Um, people need to understand that you can't have vast illegal markets which generate enormous revenues um, but are illegal because that's only going to lead to corruption which is only going to undermine the rule of law and um, eventually which is only going to undermine our democracies themselves so um, thank you again for giving me the chance to talk um, that's a more pleasant image to bring us back to Clare College and to remind us that um, you know to be at a university like Cambridge is a massive privilege and um, I hope other people uh, will use the opportunity to discover things and to try and um, find new ways of thinking about old problems. Well, thank you so much, Damien. Uh, we do have some questions coming through because you've, okay. covered, you've covered an awful lot there. Um, okay, I hope it wasn't too fast. No, not at all. It was. Uh, Fascinating, and it's great to see the images as well. I think that really brings it to life. Mm -hmm. The one, the one of the um, I, my Portuguese escapes me, but the one with the two policemen in the background. Be sure, the, yeah, it's a great oh, image. It's a real, really, really meaningful image there. It's a very iconic image, and in fact, they just made a. They haven't really talked about this man's life. He's like a massive mafia boss. He was friends with uh, João Havilange, who was the head of FIFA for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, VIPs went to his weddings. He, he ran a football team and he's basically one of like a top mafia boss. And um, they've only just made a program about him because no one really talked about his life. He died 24 years ago. And this year they brought out a program about um, him and they used this photo as the sort of image to sell the program with him because he was very charismatic. Yeah, I was going to say, you can see that charisma coming off him there, yeah. can't you? Yeah. And he was, in fact, quite, he was from a middle class family and he was, in fact, a qualified lawyer. His family were, his parents were lawyers. He, he had a lawyer's card. He was a qualified lawyer as well. So, so can, I, can I ask you a slightly personal question to start with, which is, yes. um, you talked, you've talked a lot about some of the dangers that people have encountered and, and the murders and assassinations. And you also alluded to the fact that your family were a bit worried about what you were getting up to in Brazil, mm. I think, with the words you used. Has your work brought you into any personal danger? Um, that, that um, uh, I think the only, sadly, um, you know, there is an immense problem with armed violence and gun violence in Rio. And if you go into favelas, shootouts are uh, a fact of life. And on some occasions, I've been in the vicinity of shootouts. And that's um, a fact. It is a fact that innocent people often die from stray bullets. So that's the thing that scares me in Rio, if a shootout happens in an area where I am. Um, but other than that, I haven't felt threatened. OK, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I do have some other questions coming through. Uh, for our first one um, from the audience is from Ines Gortari. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, Ines. Um, could you explain more about the significance of the Jogo do Bicho in, Brazil, in the everyday life of Brazilians? And um, are they very attached to the game? What's the sort of cultural role that it plays? Why has it become so embedded in society? Um, yeah, it's been embedded, one, because it's so long running. Um, two, because it, it's popular, because it's quite fun. I mean, it's not a lottery based on numbers. It's a lottery based on animals. So you can choose. The animals are in a series of 25, which means it can be divided into uh, sets of four, which make up 100, the numbers one to 100. And um, people talk about making bets based on animals they've dreamed of uh, or basing, based on animals they like. It's very intuitive. Um, it's a lot of fun to bet on it. And um, people talk about um, culturally it's also um, something that um, is very linked to sort of superstition and it's something that old people play 
it's very popular. You'll go, you'll go to a betting point and you will see old people queued up, queuing up to play it. Um, so it's um, something sort of very much ingrained. And then through their control of carnival, they've given themselves um, a cultural, uh, it's like a sort of cultural protective shield. So they can say, oh, we are, you know, people say we're criminals, but we're not. We're patrons of samba schools. We invest in communities and they use it as a platform um, to promote themselves and they use it to uh, develop relationships. So Castro de Andrade developed a relationship with the, the head of marketing and TV at, at Global, which if anyone who knows Brazil, Global was extremely powerful for 50 years. It's not quite as powerful now with the internet and then lots of alternative platforms, but it really did define what Brazilian, what Brazilians thought about the country, how they voted, what their tastes were, um, you know, what they thought was good and what they thought wasn't good. And this man Castor, who's in the photo, he was um, best friends practically with the, the, the second most powerful, person in the TV station who was the director of programming and so the and that in official sense he used carnival to construct that friendship he brought them in and said right we're going to give you exclusive rights to film carnival so they've been very very um canny and and it's very sophisticated really the way they've used carnival and they still run it today they formed an association of samba schools um that is entirely run by the Jogo do Bicho mafio, mafias. And um, they were in the last big police investigation, which was 10 years ago, in which sentences were issued to some of his contemporaries who are still alive, but none of them have gone to prison because they appeal and it gets lost in a, in a process of appeals. But the federal police said that the headquarters of their Samba School Association was um, the headquarters of the most dangerous armed gang in Brazil, just to give you an idea. Um, but yes, the, the popularity feeds a lot into uh, gamesmanship, superstition, and um, the fact that it's a fun game to play. And they have four draws a day, and I think they have two draws on a Sunday. So it's, I think the only, the only time it stops each year is during Carnival and for Christmas Day, I believe. Wow. Yeah. So it is the cultural equivalent of bingo, you could almost say. It <laughs> is, but, but, but bigger. And the, yeah. but, <laughs> bigger than bingo and not forgetting there are also bingo halls and these guys run them and in a bingo, I've been in a bingo hall in Rio maybe 10 years ago and um, you go in and there's a caller and tables and people playing bingo and then they have electronic gambling machines around the side and um, it's all completely illegal <laughs> and uh, these guys run it so you can imagine you need to pay the police in that area to leave you alone um, you need when you want to move your machines around, you do it illegally, but with protection and you also employ a huge amount of people. So it's completely sort of incorporated into the fabric of the city and um, life in the city. I think that that you've really emphasized from that to me, um, the sort of full integration of of. Well, I guess where you started the sort of cops and robbers rather than the cops versus robbers. And I have mm -hmm. a couple of um, really interesting questions come through from Francis Jacobs, which are related to that. Um, the first one, to what extent are the local criminal bosses in the favelas supported in their communities because they are seen as protecting the local people from the corrupt and distant state? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll answer that while it's still in my head. Um, if you live in a favela, and if you want to stay living in it, then you have to support the local boss, which doesn't mean you like the local boss or that you do actually support them. You just can't be seen to be against them um, because you don't have a choice because, because there's a state absence and because the state allows them to control that area, they make the rules. So they can decide if they accuse you of being a police informer, you can be tortured and killed or, um, if for some reason they don't like you, they can expel you from the community. So the people living in those communities, they have a gang which decide, dictates the rules of their lives. And if um, for any reason, it could be an invented reason, that gang decides that that person has done something wrong. They can, in a matter of hours, just tell them to leave and they have to go and that's it. So they live with that knowledge. And then they also live with the knowledge that the police can come in at any time 
and accuse them of being involved in a gang. Um, and they can't talk to the police. You can't be seen to talk to the police. So you're living um, sort of between crocodiles and lions. You know, it's a, it's a very uh, tough way of life, not to mention the other problems such as, um, you know, the lack of money, um, the difficulty in moving around and the stigma associated with coming from one of these communities. But uh, one in four people in Rio in the city lives in one of these communities. They're everywhere. And um, you know, there's one on my doorstep. That's just how the city is fit, fit, fits together. Favelas and, and middle-class neighborhoods next to each other. I think that Francis's second question actually leads on really, really not nicely, because this is obviously not, not a very nice thing, but it, it leads on very well. You, you say bet living between crocodiles and lions. So the next question is, what hope is there? You know, how strong are the countervailing factors to this situation, to the corruption of the, of the politicians and, um, and this whole situation? Is there any hope of, of change? Um, I think there's always hope. In the short term, it's difficult, but um, there are always there are a lot of honest police. There, it, there are a lot of serious police. You might it might not think like there are. It might not seem like there are after what how, what I've just explained. But um, there are. I've met them. I've worked with them. I've met some brilliant police in Rio, and uh, the the same policeman who told me at the beginning that studying the Jogo do Bicho was like studying the history of Brazilian politics. He said. Um, it's sort of, you'll get 10% of police who are extremely honest and do their job properly, and you'll get 10% who are like deeply crooked and um, in the pe on the payroll of organized crime, and everyone in the middle will just sort of go with the flow. You know, they'll do what is um, what they see as the, the sort of pervasing, the, the pervasive overall um, swing of things. Um, so there are always good people. There are some marvelous politicians. Um, I think Rio is always a hopeful place. It's a very um, optimistic city. I think there's been so much violence here for so long that people are very used to it and kind of quite traumatized by it. And it's um, sort of accepted that it's violent. I think change is going to be very difficult as long as you have illegal markets that are very, very big, um, that create, generate enormous revenue. I think it would be quite easy to make. Um, gambling legal but obviously there are a lot of people who are going to lose um, their illegal revenue if it was made legal so it's always it, it's often raised by certain politicians who are then they can be dismissed for being too liberal or they can be undermined by people who want to keep it illegal um, but as a British person you know gambling is not great but I'd much rather it was um, legal like it is in Britain where it can be taxed and and you know monitored and I have to say it's the same for the drug industry. And that's a global issue because unless um, certain countries or unless the UN uh, call for a massive change to drug policy, you're still gonna have these illegal drug markets. And in Latin America, which is um, the world's cocaine producer, which is probably one of the world's most popular drugs, it's Latin America that suffers. You know, Latin America didn't choose that this drug becomes popular in Europe and other places, um, it is, and they pay the consequences with, you know, massive violence on the ground, massive corruption on the ground. Um, and it's quite common for Latin American heads of state to say that they think um, this particular commodity should be um, decriminalized, as uh, an influential magazine like The Economist will also say the same thing. And it really, um, I don't find it very hopeful that this that that question is never brought to the table. It just seems to be always off the menu because it's so um, something that I think is not going to win anyone any votes when they're running for office. But um, in reality, it's one of the main sources of violence and corruption in not just in this continent across the world because cocaine smuggling routes run through West Africa. They go into Europe. Um, in the UK, there's a phenomenon now or if you have gangs in London, you know, street gangs, turf gangs who are defending an area because they sell drugs in that area. That didn't happen 30 years ago when I was growing up in London. It's got worse, not better. So unless we tackle the problem of illegal markets, and um, I don't think you're going to reduce crime and violence, either in London or in um, Rio. I think it's very similar. 
that's really interesting. One of the things I jotted down early on was that question of decriminalization. And, you know, in a simplistic way, you think surely that would be a solution. But that really helps to want me to understand why that's not a simple solution, because there's just too many people mm. have got skin in the game, I guess. Yeah, it's not a simple solution. It needs to be it's, it's something you'd have to fight very hard mm. um, to get to. But it needs to be it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. So. My last question is uh, for you more personally again, which is what's next? You've obviously done so much in Rio. You're in Rio at the moment, but you live in Africa now. So will you be carrying on with, with this sort of project? What are you, what are you turning your research eyes to in the future? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure whether I will be working with organized crime. I mean, this particular aspect of organized crime and this story is something um, close to me because it affects a lot of my friends in the place that I live in. Um, in Nairobi, I, I'm, I'm not, not plunging into uh, the world of organized crime, uh, thankfully, uh, but I'm much more interested in how to help change the lives of young people living in very difficult situations. So I'm still working with young people in Rio. One of the reasons I'm here is to um, to give an upgrade to the skate park that we built here and in Nairobi I'm also working with uh, young leaders and I'm very interested in how to open up spaces where young people living in the situation in the sort of communities that are affected by um, violence as a result of a situation like this how you can um, better their lives improve their lives give them spaces where they can um, develop and sort of have breathing spaces so I'm interested in that fundamentally. Sounds like there'll always be plenty for you to do. I think there will be, yes. <laughs> and uh, I think, well, I, I hope people don't mind me speaking on behalf of us all, where I say wish you best of luck with that and the, the incredible work you're doing. And thank you for sharing with thank us you. a glimpse into it. Um, and those insights really, I, I mean, I've, I've learned a huge amount about, um, yeah, how the social structures and the, and the political structures feed through both in terms of localized areas, but as you've, as you've alluded to, you know, global intractable issues. So really interesting, yeah. thank you so much. It exists in, in a global context. It's a local issue, but it's related to many other factors going on around the world. Absolutely. Um, thank, thank you, Katie, thank you for the invitation and all the best, wishing all the best for the rest of Gala thank Week. You. And well, and lastly, I'd like to say thank you to our audience again for joining us. I know in this webinar format, it's, it's rather difficult because we can't hear you, but we, we know you're there and we really appreciate you taking part. Um, and as I say, please do seek out the link tomorrow and, and share it as you, as you would like to. Um, and it just remains for me to say thank you again, Damien, and good night. Okay. Thank you, Katie. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye.